Man, they make you do all the numbers, right? It's on Friday in the morning, first thing. Get through this week. That's tough. I remember when I was here, we did uh, CLC or Christian Life. Uh, I don't know what they call it now. Uh, but I was always in here. I'm like, oh, Lord. Here's another speaker I have to listen to. At the beginning of my week, I have a test next period. I just need to study. I'm going to try to find a way to study where he can't see me. But I'm looking, and I know who you are. I'm just kidding. But I know that you guys have a lot going on, so I hope uh, this morning, I encourage my students each week at the village open to this, is that uh, I'm not lost where it comes to high school. I'm not lost that you guys have a lot going on. Plenty of adults will look at you and they'll say, you don't have no idea what busy is. But for you guys right now, it's the busiest you've ever been. And life is hitting you, stress is hitting you, and it's hard. And I get it. So I want you to hear that from me first today. I get it, not only because I'm a graduate of Banner, but I get it because it's not lost to me what high school is like. But my encouragement to you this morning as we look into God's word, I really do think this is something that will change the school, it'll change your heart, it'll change the way that you view every single person you come in contact with. So my encouragement to you, whatever you came into this morning, whatever baggage you came in the room this morning with, I encourage you to take it, push it to the side, and just ask Jesus to do something uh, this morning. I want to pray for you guys when we start. Can I do that for you? Let's pray. Jesus, we are so thankful for you. We are so thankful for your mission. Jesus, I pray this morning as we dive into your word, as we look on the topic of kindness, God, that we will not leave this room the same way we walked into it, that we'll have a greater view of you, that we'll have a greater view of your mission, and Jesus, ultimately, uh, that we will love people the way that you call us to love people, to be kind, tenderhearted, as you call us to be. God, be with me today as I speak, as I teach. God, help us understand your word more this morning. I pray all this in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, guys, I just said, I am the youth director of Village Students. Uh, Alex is one of my students, so I'm going to give him a shout out. Uh, <laughs> but some of you know me as Coach Jake, because uh, I coached you in basketball for a couple of years, and now you're in high school, making you feel old. Congratulations. That's great. Uh, others of you, my visiting Village Students, I always give a free plug because I have an opportunity to invite you to Village Students. We meet every week at 6 p.m. on Sunday nights. And I love in the students because we really dive into God's word. We have a good time. You can ask Alex more about that um, or me afterwards if you want to. Uh, but I was excited to come this morning when Mrs. DeHaas asked me to come. I remembered all the time that I spent here. And if you were to ask me 10 years ago, Jake, do you think you'd be standing here speaking? I would have been like, nah. <laughs> as soon as I graduated from high school, I was out. I didn't want to be around this anymore. I was like, I'm done. I'm on to the next thing. And some of you, where are my seniors at? Raise your hand. Yeah, on the back row. I get it. I got you. Got a tough place to lay your head. I understand. Senior right is hitting you? It's already there? Juniors, is the senior right is hitting you too? You're not even there yet. It's just there. But listen, when I graduated, I, I said, man, I'm, I don't think I'm ever going to come back here. But what time has done, it's been almost a decade, uh, it actually has been a decade, I can't say almost, it has been, I'm just getting old, guys, that's just the bottom line here. It's been almost a decade, or a decade since I graduated, and uh, it was just amazing to, to look back and to see how I still have friendships that I've formed here. How two of the best, my best man at my wedding and another guy at my wedding were people I went to school with here at Banner. That we kept those friendships and how treasured those friendships were to me. And so the school does hold a special place in my heart. I'll tell you a couple other things about me. I am married. Uh, my wife is wonderful. Uh, she's fantastic. I convinced her to marry me after four years, uh, which is crazy. Uh, and so, yes, got it, did it, made it, right? Other cool thing, uh, we're having our first child here upcoming in March. It's a little girl named Hazel, slightly terrified of being a dad. And all the teachers that know me are already praying right now. And they're like, oh, sweet Lord, Jake Morris is having a child. <laughs> That's terrifying. I know, I get it. It's okay. But yeah, so married and having my first shot in March. I love basketball. I love baseball. I have more basketball shoes than my wife has shoes. Uh, so I love that. If you love talking basketball shoes or sneakers, I will talk to you about that all day. I love that. Um, and I just have a unique perspective 
on most speakers that you're going to have probably this semester. That I'm older, but I remember what it was like to walk these halls. That I've walked these halls. I've led worship for Bear on that stage. That I've had classes with your teachers. That I know in some ways what you're going through. And so today, I was given the task to speak to you on kindness. And here's the deal with kindness. Unless you're in sin, you want people to be kind to you. And if you don't, I can point you to a couple doctors that be okay. But most people do want kindness. You want somebody to be kind to you. Because when somebody is kind to you, the thing that that does is it makes us feel comfortable. It makes us feel wanted. The issue, though, is that kindness is not always something that we give or feel towards us. And here's the thing I want to propose to you this morning. When it comes to kindness, I think we're asking the wrong question, and it's getting us to the wrong answer. And I think what God's word is going to do as we walk through this passage is it's a story you've heard before, but if you really dive into what it's saying, it doesn't say what you think it says. In fact, it's telling us to do something completely different than what we know to do. And so I hope this morning that we can see that if we claim Jesus as king, so if you're going to a Christian school, most of you, I'm not going to say all, but I would say the majority of you would claim Jesus as Lord, that you would say that I'm a Christian. Then we have to say, what does Jesus say about the way we treat others? What does Jesus say about the way we are to live our lives? And I think this is an important thing for us to see. And I hope this morning uh, that I can also throw in parts of my own story to tell you a little bit about my high school experience and how those things, the decisions you're making today, do travel with you and they stay with you. So if you have your Bibles, which I don't know if you do, if you don't, that's all good. Uh, we're going to be in Luke uh, 10. I'm going to go ahead and read the first part of this for you. It says this, Behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. So here I want to do a little bit of context here. That Jesus is in the heart of his earthly ministry. So Jesus has come, he's grown up, and he's in that three-year period where he's ministering to the people where he's at. He's in the heart of it. And this lawyer comes to him. And the lawyer is how we would view a lawyer today. This is not saying somebody of the law, meaning somebody that was writing out God's word or a scribe or anything like that. It is a lawyer how you would see them today. And the lawyer is coming to Jesus to ask him a question, but he's not doing it in a nice way. He actually is coming to him in the face and trying to trip Jesus up. And so the lawyer comes to Jesus and asks him the question, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? I don't know about you, but I feel like that's a pretty important question. It's probably the most important question we could ever ask is what do we need to do to live eternally? To never die? To be forever with God? What is written in the law? That's what Jesus says. Did you notice that? The first thing Jesus says is what is written in the law? Because you see, what Jesus does is he goes back to the Old Testament. Because if you know anything about Jesus, you know that Christians, we claim that Jesus is the Son of God and he's God himself. And so when Jesus says what's written in the law, what he's really saying is, let's go back to my word. Let's go back to what I wrote before. What did I say? And so the lawyer tells him, there's two things that we're to do. And that's love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus later said that on these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. And so Jesus is saying that on these two things all the law can be put. Either loving God or loving your neighbor. I don't know about you guys, but if you've ever had to read through the Old Testament and you get to all the laws, it can be overwhelming. You're like, How, what, do I have to follow these? Like, I can't eat bacon. Is that what you're telling me? Because if that's it, Jesus, I might be out. Like, that's, that's, what, that's where you're at. And, that, and by the way, you can, and I do. Just take a look at me. I do. Trust me. I eat bacon. I love bacon. But here's the thing. God's law, there's over 600 laws. 600. And what Jesus says is that all 600 can be boiled down to two things. Either love God or love others. And that's the whole law is found in that. So for us, we can look at that and say it seems pretty simple, right? If I just love God and love others, I'm fulfilling the law. Fantastic. 
you got two rules. If your parents just gave you two rules, how would you feel? Pretty fantastic, right? You're like, I think I can do that. Or, if you were like me, you'd be like, all right, that's only two rules I have to find a way around. I can spend my time trying to figure that out in real time. But yeah, the issue is pretty simple for us, though. That when we look at love God, love others, there's a gigantic hole. Because we don't do that well. If you took an honest look at your life, have you tried to love God or have you successfully loved God with all your heart? Does Jesus have your full attention all the time? Do you only think about things of God? Your soul? Do you know your destiny? Do you trust in that? Your mind? Does, does God have control of your mind every second of every day of your life? And your strength? Is every part of who you are completely for his God and towards nothing else? And friends, let me tell you that there is no one on this earth that is doing that. Because that's impossible for us. That because of sin, because when sin entered into us through Adam and Eve, it wrecked everything. And it made it where we couldn't fulfill that. The next one you might say, Jacob, pretty good at it. Loving my neighbor as myself. Let me ask you, how many of you have siblings in this room? Raise your hand. You love them consistently all the time? Good? Fantastic? Yeah, I'm certainly probably. So, no. <laughs> um, you probably wanted to kill them at some point this week. Um, don't. But, we don't love well there. What about an ex girlfriend or boyfriend? Man, I'm going to walk in these halls. It's awkward. You can't escape them. You're not, you're, you go to a private Christian school. There's no escaping. You're going to come in contact with them at some point. <laughs> to your terror, you might share the locker next to them or something. It's terrifying. So you face them. But I guarantee that your heart isn't, I wish them all the best. I hope that they're just so, so good. No. You're hoping that they trip down the stairs and that you get to watch. And I'm judging you because I'm judging myself as I used to Ex-friends the same way. What about parents? Ooh. Loving others well. When we say that we love our parents well, every single day of our lives, probably not. And I'm going to throw this one in there, nerds and brownie points, teachers. Ooh. Uh, yeah. I failed at that one, it's nice. Uh, I failed at that one. <laughs> But look, you see, without Jesus, we're incapable of fulfilling any of them. And that's the point Jesus is trying to say. Did you know that's the point of the entire law of the Old Testament? If you want to sum it up into one thing, it's that you aren't good enough. You're not good enough. You can't attain it. You can't get it. You can't do it. You can't love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You can't love your neighbor as yourself. And so the lawyer's response should have been, but Jesus, this is impossible. How can I keep your law? And you see, for us to obey, we have to have faith in Jesus because he fulfilled the law for us. And this is why Jesus is so important. We read this to you from Romans 8. The Apostle Paul says, For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So you see that we could not fulfill the law on our own. So what did God do? God came himself and fulfilled the law himself. What we believe about Jesus is that he fulfilled the law perfectly, that Jesus never sinned. That he's the sinless son of God. And so when Jesus came and lived the perfect life, he fulfilled the entire law for all of those who trust in him. And that's what the Apostle Paul was saying. So yes, you cannot do it on your own, but Jesus did it for you. And that's why the gospel is such good news, that I can't do it, but Jesus did, and he has. But this is important for us as we talk about kindness. Because I don't think it's by chance that Jesus starts here and then goes into a parable about kindness. You see, Jesus here is showing that in order for us to see who is our neighbor, that we have to come in contact with him first. We have to come in contact with the right mindset 
about God and others. That loving God and loving others are the marks of a Christian life. Did you know that you cannot be a Christian and not love God? That shouldn't be shocking. That's pretty much Christianity. But you also know that you can't love God and not love others. Those things are incompatible. And that's what Jesus is saying there, that we have to have both. And before we go into this, I want to make sure that it's clear that we are not saved by works. Sometimes we can look at that verse and say, okay, well, if I just love God and love others and I'm good, I can get to heaven. And that's not what the passage is saying at all. Remember, it's saying that we aren't good enough. That we ultimately are saved by grace, and the grace is that Jesus came and died in our place for our sins and our shame. But God's word also tells us in the book of James that faith without works is dead. It's useless. So you can say you love God all you want. You can say that I'm a Christian as much as you want. But if your life doesn't show it, then there's no real love for God there at all. And that you're actually living a lie. So with this in mind, Jesus tells the parable of the Good Samaritan. And I want to pause here real quick because if you've grown up in church or you've grown up throughout school, you've probably heard the story of the Good Samaritan multiple times. This is one that's heard all the time. And basically at the end, everybody's like, just be nice to everybody. And you walk away and you're like, okay, cool. Fantastic. That's not what I want. Okay. So here's what I encourage you guys to do today. If you've heard the story a thousand times, my encouragement to you is to look at it maybe for the first time and say, Jesus, what are you actually trying to tell me here? What is the point of you telling me this? And why is it important to realize? So let me read it for you. It says, but he, that be the lawyer, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, the Levite, when he came to the place, he saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you. When I come back. First, I want us to notice that the lawyer is actually asking a different question. You notice he's saying there, who is my neighbor? Basically, what the lawyer is asking is, what is the bare minimum requirement for a neighbor? I think that's something maybe we ask sometimes. God, who is the bare minimum of who I need to consider a neighbor? And you see, for the Jews back then, in this context, they would have only known their neighbor to be fellow Jews. Anybody that was outside of Judaism, they would not have seen as a neighbor or somebody that they are to love, but just somebody they could ignore because they weren't part of the fold. Now, I think this is where we also struggle, that we see our neighbors as anyone who is like us. Have you noticed that it's easy to love people who are just like you? Why? Because they're just like you. There's nothing different about them. But the minute something's different, this can be anything in our society today, race is a common one. Social status, I think, is a bigger one. That we don't want to go too far one way or the other because it makes us uncomfortable, so we stay within the same area, within the same friends. Sometimes we get revolve around sports or other type of activities that you do, whether that's art, sports, whatever it is, music, that we gather together in these and say, those are my neighbors and groups of friends. Anybody that's outside of your circle is not your neighbor, and you don't care about them as much as you care about those inside of your circle. But Jesus, however, is going to take this question and twist it to where he wants it to go. You see, Jesus is going to take it from saying, who am I kind to, to how do I display kindness? And that's a different question, completely. One is you're saying, what's the bare minimum? The other one is saying, how do I attain this life to be kind to others? And so that's when Jesus tells this story. You see, Jesus used something called parables. If you guys don't know what a parable is, it's simply a made-up story that proves a point. Jesus used these all throughout his life here on earth. He would use these stories that were legitimate things that could have happened in that time to relate to people. And so Jesus is using the story of a man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho, which was a long road that was dangerous. 
You see, robbers would hide in the caves and the rocks and all of those things going along the road so that if somebody was by themselves, they would come out from behind the rocks, beat the living tar out of the person, and leave them dead and steal all their stuff. And just imagine being this man. He's by himself. He's walking down this road. Robbers come, beat him within an inch of his life, and he's left there bleeding with nothing. That's this guy's situation, that he's been robbed of everything, and he's about to be robbed of his own life because he slowly is dying. So, a robbed man's there practically by himself, with no hope, but then someone comes down the road, and he notices the first person come down the road is a priest, and a priest back then were those Jewish men who performed the sacrifices at the temple and maintained the temple. They were the holy men of God. They were the ones that were supposed to know God's law the most. They were the ones that were supposed to be closest to God himself. And we don't know exactly why he did not stop. You see, this is a parable, so it's not an actual event. People like to try to say a bunch of different reasons why he did it. But the ultimate thing is not why he didn't stop. It's what he did, which is not stop. That's the point Jesus is making. This priest did not stop. It doesn't matter why, he just didn't. But notice what it does, what it says. It doesn't say he just walked by him. It says that he went around him. He went to the other side. That he didn't want to be near him. And this person, this priest, is the person that I feel that I match up the most with in the story. So I'll tell you guys a little bit about my story. Uh, when I was in middle school, uh, I was brutally picked on. Uh, just brutal, uh, just terrible, uh, nonstop. Probably had like one friend. Uh, I was suicidal. Uh, my mom uh, was in the hospital with a, a spe like a severe disease where she was having seizures all the time. Uh, so my mom almost died twice uh, when I was in middle school, and I was facing all of that. And uh, I remember sitting with Miss Burkett and her sitting there with me, and I was doing my interview for band. And I was just praying, God, somehow help me to be able to come here and start over. And my grades weren't that great. I remember Miss B looking at me and saying, Jacob, I'm going to give you a shot. I believe you can do this. And so I came here. You notice that I said Jacob, because I used to go by Jacob, but I hated middle school so much that I changed what everybody called me to Jacob. I never wanted to go back to Jacob. The only people now that call me Jacob are my parents, because they refused to call me Jacob. But I want to get so far away from my problems, from my pain, that I came here. And the crazy part about when I came here was it gave me a fresh start. I don't know about any of you, but a fresh start is always amazing. Because no one really knows you. That you get to write the story. You get to write what your destiny is. And so when I came here, I intentionally found the people that I knew were going to be influencers in the school. I became friends with those people. I became part of the group that was popular. And then I also came in contact with Jesus. You see, in middle school, I had a friend from Banner invite me to church, to this church, for his youth group. And I had a, a contact with Jesus, and I loved the story of Jesus and what that meant. But you see, what it was for me and for many of you, I guarantee you that you're here, is that it was all in my head and it wasn't in my heart. Because the issue with Jesus is that if it's just in your head, if he's just an idea or a thought, if he's just a historical figure and he doesn't do anything to change you, then he's just a thought. And that's who Jesus was. But I lived a Christian life. I was a great Christian. Yes, I talked all the time in school. That was my downfall. Mr. the hospital would preach. She was like, amen. Jake never was quiet. Uh, I constantly talked, but now my job is talking. So it worked out. Uh, fantastic. But I talked all the time. That was my downfall. But I was on the praise team. When I was in like 10th or 11th grade, I received a Christian Citizenship Award. I'm not bashing the award, but I'm pretty sure it's like best Christian. I'm not sure what that means. But I got that. I was on the praise team here. I preached my first sermon in 10th grade from the stage in front of Bethany Wood. To everybody, Jake was the Christian guy, to the point where they would call me Pastor Jake jokingly. 
Pastor Jay. And I had arrived where I wanted to be. I had influence, I had friends, but there was another side to me that was much darker. And that was that with the people that were outside of that group, I became what I hated. You see, I became the bully. I became the gossip. And my bullying wasn't physical. Oh no, no. Physical, anybody can do that. Mine was mental. That I would break people down mentally. I would hurt them by my words and gossip about them to ruin them. Friends, I'm doing all this while I'm up here singing Jesus is God. And in my heart, I'm, I have sin that I tell people about. I'm struggling. And then I'm going to my classmates and mocking them, sometimes right into their face, forgetting everything I had done. You see, I knew all the right answers, but I had reached the wrong destination. And for many of you in this room, you might agree with that, even if you don't say it out loud, because you can understand that. That everybody else might think you're good, but you're not. And it's seen in the way that you treat people. And the priest has shown in that too. That the priest actually didn't believe what he said he did because it was shown through his actions. And for me, there's still people to this day that I'm hoping to run into to apologize to them for what I did to them in high school. Guys, it's a decade later. I'm almost 30. I know I'm old. A decade later, it still follows me. So if you hear nothing else I say this morning, be careful of the decisions you make today because those decisions can haunt you. You will regret them. And I encourage you to look closer at the story and to see how Jesus calls us to be. You see, it wasn't just a priest. The next person to come was a Levite. And a Levite was basically somebody who was an assistant to the priest. Anybody a fan of the office in here? Anybody like the office? Love the office? Dwight Schrute was the assistant <laughs> to the regional manager. He also was the assistant to the assistant regional manager. Arm. Ah, so that was for anybody that watches the office. But the Levites were the assistant to the regional manager of the Bible. That's who they were. That they were the assistants. They were the ones that helped the priests in all their duties. So they were not priests, but they were still held in high regard. But you notice that this man also comes by. So yes, he's not a priest, but he's still a holy man. A little bit different. Still the same thing, though. Goes right around. Other side of the road, walk by. And here's what I want us to understand. The man that got beaten was Jewish. The priest and the Levite were Jewish. What they were supposed to do was help their own people, and they weren't even willing to help their own people for either fear of death, for fear of recognition, whatever that is. They did not do it. So, there was one man that did, though. That was a Samaritan. And the thing about Samaritans is that you have to kind of understand back then, because if you read the Bible, sometimes it can get lost on us. It can get lost on us who they were or why this is so important. Because we are not Israelites. You may have Jewish heritage, but you're not an Israelite back in this time. And so, a Samaritan was basically a half Jew, half Gentile. In history, you see that Samaria fell to the Assyrian Empire, and non-Jews were brought into the region. And so what happened was that the Samaritans, who were Jewish, started marrying people who were not Jewish. And what it created was somebody who was part Jew and part not. And the thing about the Jews was that they wanted to keep themselves holy because they thought that they were God's people, which they were. And so when the Jews came back to Jerusalem and started to try to build the temple, the Samaritans came to help them because they still felt they were Jewish. But the Jews looked at them and said, we don't want you. Get out of here. You have Greeks. And the Samaritans didn't take that well because none of us are. And the, so the Samaritans blocked the temple building. They got so frustrated, they actually stopped the Jews from building the temple, and it created this division between the Jews and the Samaritans. 
to the point where the Samaritans actually built a separate temple, a completely different temple on a different mountain, and saying that's where God is, not in Jerusalem. But the Jews and the Samaritans hated each other. I don't use that word lightly. They hated them. To the point where the quickest way to get to Galilee from Jerusalem was to go straight up through Samaria. But people would walk four times longer to go all the way around Samaria to get to Galilee. Why? Because they hated them. They didn't want to see them. They didn't want to touch them. They didn't even want to walk on the same land they did. They hated Samaritans. And so Jesus is telling this story to a bunch of Jews, and he says a Samaritan walks by, and immediately they go, oh, Samaritans. Can't stand Samaritans. I don't want to hear about a Samaritan. Surely he's going to walk by and do nothing because they're useless. But I want you to notice that Jesus uses this character for a reason. Keep that in mind as we go throughout the rest of the story. But it's interesting because even Samaritans, so Jesus one time, when he was speaking, the Jews called him a Samaritan and a demon. Basically a demon Samaritan, basically garbage. That is what we're dealing with when we talk about Samaritans and who Jesus is talking about. So the Jews hated the Samaritans, but this Samaritan, however, does something that no one else does. It's one of my favorite things in the Gospels that Jesus does. When Jesus sees somebody in need, it says that he looked on with compassion. Compassion. And the Samaritan is walking by this Jewish man who he sees bleeding out. And he has compassion on him. He says, surely I can help this man with whatever he needs. So the Samaritan begins to bandage up his wounds. He applies basic first aid to help the man stop bleeding and provide relief. The man couldn't even walk. If you look back at the story, I encourage you guys even later, check out the story, reread it. The man, the Jewish man, couldn't even walk. He was beaten so badly that he had to put him on his donkey. And here's the thing. If he did that, guess what? He had to walk beside the donkey. He couldn't ride. So this man is taking this Jewish man. He's a Samaritan. He's supposed to hate him. He bandaged up his wounds. Which, once again, you're defiling yourself in the Old Testament if you touch blood. So he's already going too far on that. He's having to walk beside the donkey so this man can ride. And then he goes one step further. He goes to an inn. Back then it wasn't really hospitals, but they had places for people to recover. So he took him to this inn. And he says, look, I'm going to put a down deposit, which was two days' wages at that point. And he said, I'm going to put these two days' wages down. And then once I do that, I'm going to come back later. And I'll pay whatever is necessary to get him back to full health. And so Jesus tells the story of a Samaritan being the only person that comes to the health of the Jew in their greatest time of need. So then we have to ask the question of why. Why would Jesus intentionally choose someone who was an outsider, who was despised and hated, to make his point? And I think it's because being a neighbor is not about race, nationality, status, friends, whatever. But it's about something completely different. And I think we see that in Luke 10, 36 through 37. You see, the lawyer, after hearing the story, he says this. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Friends, you see in this passage, Jesus turned the question on its head. He says, which of these men... Walked away justified. And it wasn't the Jews. That the Jews had to admit that their people failed in the story. And the Samaritan was the one that did the right thing. Why? Because he showed them mercy. And then Jesus gives the tough response of that we are to go and do likewise. And Jesus here is making a powerful point. That our kindness should not be based on any visible quality of the person in front of us. That so for your classmates, everybody in this room has a high school. It doesn't matter if you're the same race. It doesn't matter if you're in the same grade. It doesn't matter if you're at the same economic level, with the same amount of money, with the same amount of popularity. It's that our kindness to others is based on something different.
And that's how Jesus talks about the law. He says, if you love God, you will love others. And you love others, that means everyone. God's standard is not the bare minimum. It's everyone that you possibly know. That we're to show the love to everyone and kindness to everyone. That's what Jesus is getting at. To the point where he's saying even Samaritan showed kindness to a Jew, to the people he hated. And so for us, man, what, that say, what does that say about us? What does it say about our lives and who we're to love? It's a struggle. That I think that if we're honest, maybe even this morning, that you could be honest and say, Jake, there was somebody this morning that really got on my nerves to the point where I just wanted to get away from them. And if that's you, welcome to the club. Happens to me every single day. I get annoyed very easily. We have people that annoy us. We have people that we wish that they weren't here. Like to the point where if they're sick, we're like, well, at least I don't have to worry about it today. That sounds harsh, but it's true. That that's where our heart goes. We go to that level of saying that we just don't care. But sometimes it goes even deeper than that. Sometimes we would say we genuinely hate someone. We hate them maybe because they're different, because they don't fit our definition of normal. By the way, none of you are normal. I'm not normal. All of us have weird things about us. It's just the way life is, okay? The older you get, the more you find that out. But sometimes people don't fit into what your box is of a normal person, and so you judge them based on your standard. But you might be on the other end of that. Maybe it's because there's a person in this room that really hurt you. Maybe they hurt you on a daily basis by their words. Maybe you know the rumors they've been spreading about you, and it, it kind of eats away at you, and you hate them. That's what we deal with. And so we hear Jesus saying, we need to love God and love others. And you might be saying, Jesus, that's great, fantastic, but you don't get it. You don't understand what I'm going through. You don't understand what this person has done to me. You don't understand what this person is. That's our actual heart. If we're honest, if we took a look inside our hearts, really, we think that's where we would naturally be. Would say, Jesus, you don't get it. This person is different. And I think this is where Jesus speaks into our lives. I want to read this verse for you guys. Romans 5, 8 through 10. Love this passage. If you tune down, if you're asleep, or whatever, tune back in real quick for this. It says, But God showed his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Friends, I want you to see something very clear. In that passage, you're described in two ways. First, sinner. Second, enemy. And what the passage says is that Jesus didn't die for you at your best. Jesus didn't die for you when you felt like you had your whole life together. That everything is perfect. And you present Jesus with this perfect picture of who you are. No, Jesus died for you at your worst. Your very worst. The day that you wish never existed. He died for you on that day, in that condition. That condition. But it's not just that. It says, while we were enemies of God, that that's who we were in our sin. That's where our sin gets us, is being an enemy of God. That we are against God. It's practically like spitting in Jesus' face is what we do with our sin. But what that verse says is that while we were enemies of God, while we were the ones that were spitting in his face, what did Jesus do? He lived a perfect life for us. He went on a cross and he died for us. And then he rose again to prove he had power over him and that he was for the second. But friends, don't get it twisted. Jesus died for you at his worst so that he could give you his best. My question for you is why do we think that we can give him anything different? 
by the way we treat him and the way we treat other people. And so this morning, as I close out, very practically, many of you in this room this morning are in one or two places. Either you're the one that's saying the things about others that you shouldn't. Either you're the one that's lying about other people, gossiping about other people, bringing other people down with your words, or you're the one that's receiving on the receiving end of that. And friends, let me tell you, high school is tough, but those things follow you. And they will follow you and follow you because sin doesn't go away unless you deal with it. And that's what that is, it's sin. That there's something wrong with us. And the way that we change that is to look to Jesus and say, if Jesus can die for me at my worst, and if I trust him as my God and he gives me his righteousness, surely I can love the person that sits across from me in my class. Yes, but they may be different than me. Yes, I might not agree with everything they do. Maybe they even hurt me. But Jesus loved me when I hurt him, so I can then love people when they hurt me. That's the call of the gospel. And so for many of you in the room this morning, I truly believe what repentance looks like for you is that when you leave this room, like don't wait. When you're at the lockers later, don't wait. Go to the person and say, look, even if they don't know it, this is scary. Say, I've been spreading lies about you. I've been talking about you. But listen, what he said this morning is true. If Jesus died for me at my worst, then I should give my best, and I'm sorry. And then if you're on the receiving end of that, then you can come back and say, because Jesus forgave me, I can forgive them. And see how that works. But friends, that's my hope for you this morning. That you look at what we talked about with the Good Samaritan. That's a love God and a love others. We can't do it on our own, but that Jesus did it for us. And if Jesus did it for us, that means that we can love anyone and everyone. We can show kindness to anyone. But what it's going to take is us laying our lives down at the feet of Jesus and saying, Jesus, forgive me for the way I've treated people. Help me to love people the way that you love people as we go to love people. But friends, this morning, if that hits you, if that's where you're at, do not wait. Don't regret it later. Repent, turn to Jesus, trust Jesus, and then go and reconcile relationships. I can tell you, if you do that, this school will change radically. You'll see a change in the entire landscape. Because what that does is it says, Jesus is our king together. And so we're going to walk and run after him together. And that's my hope for you as Banner, because you are my home and my friends, and I love you guys. Run to Jesus, trust in him, and let him do the work in your heart. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for the students here at Banner. God, I'm so thankful for their lives. I'm so thankful that they are able to come to the school. God, we're thankful for, for the school, for the opportunity that we have to, to have an education, not just that's fantastic for everything else, but that ultimately it's revolved around you and around the gospel, around your son Jesus and who you are. And God, I pray this morning that in this room that you do a work that only you can do. Jesus, help us to see the places where we are not being kind. Show us the places where we are failing other people and ultimately failing your gospel by talking about them, by not treating them the way that they should be treated as a fellow Christian, as a fellow person who follows after you. Jesus, I pray this morning that you help us to see that you died for us when we were at our worst. When we had no hope, when we were angry, Jesus said, you stood in our place. And Jesus, help us as we have conversations today, as hard as they're going to be, as difficult as these conversations will be, Jesus, help us to trust you enough to know that if we have them, if we repent, if we turn towards you, that you will do a work in the school, that you will make this a school that's a city on a hill that other people will look at and say, what is so different about these high schoolers that they can be so unified? God, I pray that you unify them, not under anything of their own, but under the gospel. Jesus, help us as we live for your mission. I pray all this in your name. Amen. Mm -hmm. Guys, thank you so much.
Like, honestly, I love being back here. Besides, thank you for inviting me. It's been fantastic. Um, I think I have like five minutes if you want to ask questions. You can even ask questions just about high school. Y'all tell you some interesting stories. Anybody got any questions? This is the fun part, right? Sorry, I was like, he was pointing, I'm like, where all of you? Yeah, what's up? How did you become a pastor? I don't know. How did you become a pastor? I don't know, become a pastor. Um, so, uh, when I graduated from Banner, uh, one of the teachers that used to work here, Steve Gentry, uh, he invited me to a Bible study at his house, and he said, hey, Jay, come start a church. It's called Village Church. And so, I, as a college student, went to that church. I served, I set up signs at 6 a.m. outside of the freezing cold. That was a mistake. Uh, I was told he could put me anywhere, and that's where he put me. Uh, and so I ended up being there for a while. I went to uh, Liberty uh, after my freshman year. I went to John Tyler, and I was in the worship program. I wanted to be a worship leader. That was kind of where I felt like my life was going. Uh, but then I took music theory, and I quickly realized this wasn't where I wanted my life to go. Uh, music theory is terrible. Uh, and so I started going around to different things. I went to the youth ministry department. Ultimately, I went to the biblical studies department. Uh, from my pastor, and then my senior year, he asked me uh, to come and take a job at his church, and so then I took that. So I did that. I got my master's from Southeastern Seminary in Wake Forest, North Carolina. Uh, it took me five years because uh, it's a long program. Uh, so I can tell you, and this is the thing, the truth, because Ms. Osh will be talking about this. If I can get a master's, anybody can. That's true. It's just 100% accurate because I was not, I did not love reading. Yeah, so that's how I became a pastor. It really was just that my pastor spoke into my life and gave me a, a vision for what it looked like to be in ministry uh, and something that I love. And so that's what I did. Yeah. What else? Anything else? Alex, you haven't told me about my nickname, have you? I have not. Okay, that's good. We're not going to talk about that. No, go ahead. Talk about that. Fine, fine, fine. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> we're all friends here. We're all friends here. So my favorite teacher, I can tell you, because and she doesn't teach here anymore. Uh, Miss Hayes. Anybody oh, remember? Oh. So Miss Hayes. Let me tell you something about Miss Hayes. She knew who I was, and she didn't care. So Miss Hayes, every day I would walk in and be like, yep, just saw Saw 4, and she's like, hey, Jake, Philippians 4-8, whatever's holy, justifiable, da 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 And I'm like, oh, God. Uh, but that's what she did. And I'll never forget, I wrote a paper one time, I was like, this is a dope paper, man. I love this. This is awesome. A plus. And she's like, oh, today you're going to be reading them out loud. I'm like, say that again. <laughs> and every time I said she would, I would see her with a red pen, I said it was blood of the martyrs, like she's just, the whole page is red. And I think she gave me a C minus on it. <laughs> but yeah, so she was one of my, she was probably one of my favorites, to be honest. Miss DeHaas too, that's why she's sitting in here, just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> Miss DeHaas did give me, so my master's, my, uh, my cognate, so the, the main part of study was counseling for psychology, because I started that, so yeah, it's good. Any other questions? Yeah. Greg, you spoke about, um, if we are on the end where perhaps we're ridiculing or bullying someone yeah. else to take action today, yeah. I've had some students confide in me that they're on the other end, they're on mm -hmm. the receiving end. Yeah. Do you have any insight for what they can do today to deal yeah. with that situation? Um, when you're on the receiving end, it's much tougher because you don't know how that person's going to respond. But my honest thing with that is that if you truly believe Jesus is who he says he is, that you can come in boldness. So the Bible talks about it all the time. That if we're in Christ, we can boldly approach God's throne. And if I can boldly approach God's throne, I can approach the person that's hurting me. And that's the scary part. But we have to trust God enough in that to say to them, look, I feel like you're saying this about me. Can we talk about it? I'm just going to tell you how you're hurting me. And friends, if somebody comes to you today and has that conversation, do not mock them. If you do, everything I said this morning is useless. But I truly believe that if you go to somebody and they have that conversation, that it's received well. That it can be received well. So that would be my encouragement to them, is to take that to them. So, that's it. Yeah, yeah. My what? 
all the nicknames. So uh, Alex called, they called me Papa Jake, which is weird. Um, <laughs> but luckily, they called me that. They didn't know that my wife was pregnant when they started calling me that. And so now it's not as bad. But yeah, so with that, leave in peace. But guys, thanks so much. Appreciate you guys.